Hubble finds three giant exoplanets and several brown dwarfs in Orion Nebula. Using the NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope to peer deep into the famous Orion Nebula, Space Telescope Institute researcher Massimo Roberto and colleagues searched for small faint bodies. They found 17 very low mass brown dwarf companions, two red dwarf stars, one brown dwarf pair, and one brown dwarf dwarf. One brown dwarf with a planetary companion. The astronomers also found three giant exoplanets, including a binary system where two planets orbit each other in the absence of a host star. It's a nice picture. The Orion Nebula, also known as NGC 1976, Messier 42, M42, LBN 974, and Sharpless 281, is a diffuse nebula in the constellation Orion. It spans about 24 light years and is located approximately 1,350 light years away from Earth. It can be seen with the naked eye as a fuzzy patch. Surrounding the star, Theta Orionis, in the hunter's sword below Orion's belt, the Orion Nebula is an excellent laboratory for studying star formation process across a wide range from opulent giant stars to diminutive red dwarf stars and elusive faint brown dwarfs. Because brown dwarfs are colder than stars, Dr. Roberto and co-authors used Hubble to identify them by the presence of water in their atmospheres. These are so cold that water vapor forms. Water is a signature of substellar objects, as in an amazing and very clear mark. As the masses get smaller, the stars become redder and fainter, and you need to view them in the infrared. And in infrared light, the most prominent feature is water, Dr. Roberto explained. But hot water vapor in the atmosphere of brown dwarfs cannot be easily seen from the Earth's surface. Now how? If the star is cold, how can it have hot water vapor? Because they're measuring the outside and not what's going on inside. Due to absorbing effects of water vapor in our own atmosphere. Fortunately, Hubble is up above the atmosphere and has near-infrared vision that can easily spot water on distant worlds. Astronomers identified 1,200 candidate red reddish stars. They found that the stars split up into two distinct populations, those with water and those without. The bright ones with water are confirmed to be faint red dwarfs in this picture right here. The team also looked for fainter binary companions of those 1,200 reddish stars. Because they are so close to their primary stars, these companions are nearly impossible to discover using standard observing methods. But by using a unique high contrast imaging technique developed by the astronomers, they were able to resolve faint images of larger number of candidate companions. The first analysis did not allow Hubble astronomers to determine whether these objects orbit the brighter star, or if their proximity in the Hubble image is a result of a chance alignment. As a consequence, they are classified as candidates for now. However, the presence of water in their atmospheres indicates that most of them cannot be misaligned stars in the galactic background, and thus must be brown dwarfs, or exoplanet companions. In all, the researchers found 17 candidate brown dwarf companions to red dwarf stars, one brown dwarf pair, and one brown dwarf with a planetary companion. The study also identified three potential planetary mass companions, one associated to a red dwarf, to one to a brown dwarf, and one to another planet. So isn't that something? Brown dwarfs and red dwarfs hang around together. Just wanted to share that story with you. And I mean to tell you, it is cold out there. How cold is it? It is so cold that the brown dwarfs out there have to wear sweaters. When I do a mainstream story, if I can find a related 
Thunderbolt story, oh, and I happened to find one from Thunderbolts on Cold Plasma, the Iran Nebula. So briefly read it, and I'll leave a link in the description to the article. Rather than simply clouds of dust and gas, spiraling filaments and nebulae suggest electric currents in space. The Orion Nebula is faintly visible to the naked eye, as the second star in Orion saw a multi-light year wide cloud of interstellar dust and gas. The astrophysical community sees several formations with the nebular cloud to be star forming regions because they have detected high frequency light from many active areas, gamma rays, x-rays, and high frequency ultraviolet are being emitted by what have been termed cosmic eggs because they appear to be the glowing tips of condensed gas balls that have ignited in fusion reactions. Conventional astronomers do not know how stars throw off clouds of gas and dust that eventually become other stars because stars are not made of gas and dust. A star is the focus of Birkeland currents that make up circuits flowing around the galaxy. The electromagnetic pinch that squeezes plasma into the star also forms a toroidal current around the star's equator. The density of the current causes plasma in the ring to glow. The electric universe explanation is that we are looking at plasma structures when we look at nebulae and they behave according to the laws of electric discharges and circuits. Instead of mechanical action and cold dust, the Orion Nebula's radiant new stars were created in a boost of electric current. It is not necessary to prevent young stars from heating up by shielding them in cold dust. The electrical sheath around a new star receives input from the galactic Birkeland currents, in which it is immersed and gets pushed into glow discharge state. Gravity has little, if anything, to do with the process of star formation. The consensus view is that cold dust is a necessary ingredient when stars condense out of nebulae. When gas and dust start to collapse into a new star, it naturally warms up and radiates energy. As the theory states, outward pressure is created that opposes the inward force of gravity. If the outward force wins and overcomes the force of gravity, the atoms in the gas will never be compressed enough to undergo nuclear fusion. However, if the dust in the nebula is cold enough, it allows the heat created in the gravitational collapse to be radiated away. Therefore, a new star can ignite. On the other hand, when the electric universe theory is considered, cold nebulae are evidence of electrical activity even at temperatures near absolute zero. Uh, that would be a superconduct. Bipolar symmetry is typical of most nebulae, and most of them are dense enough to emit light because they are extremely hot in some regions. But the middle of the Orion Nebula is cold. Radio measurements indicate the dust clouds around the inner part are only one degree above absolute zero. We are able to see the center of the nebula because dust particles reflect light from the star. The filamentary structure of the fingers and the way the filaments spiral away from the central stars indicates Birkeland currents, named after Christian Burke, who first proposed their existence in the late 1800s. And he was made a laughing stock, turned out that he was correct. It seems to be a trend in science. These currents form scalable tubes of plasma that can transmit electric power all around the galaxy. Electromagnetic forces sometimes cause them to pinch down to smaller and smaller sizes. Plasma confined within the center of the pinch is crushed and increases in current density until the so-called Z-pinch produces a star. Plasma surrounding the star will often glow as an emission nebula, but in some conditions, opacity and density the surrounding plasma can be cold, as in the Orion Nebula, revealing its presence only in infrared light. The correct model for a nebula is a neon lamp that emits light only at the excitation frequency excitation. of that specific gas. Electricity passing through the tube causes the neon plasma to glow a pale yellow. Astronomers say a shock wave from a supernova is able to initiate many frequencies of light due to the heat of compressed gas. But since more than 90% of the light from planetary nebulae is in the frequency range of ionized oxygen, then they should be thought of 
as oxygen discharge tubes and not as clouds of gas. Astronomers have infected physics with the hot gas theory, causing a 50-year failed experiment with nuclear fusion. Squeezing hot gas into a volume small enough for fusion to take place has not worked, and we predict that it never will work. The theory of star formation through fusion reactions is untenable, so utilizing the theories of plasma behavior might be a more productive path. Stephen Smith. You know, the I don't know if you're up with the latest with the Sapphire Project, but if you want to watch their latest video on YouTube, the model they have is putting out 1,100 times more power than it takes in. They have recreated the electric sun in the lab. Not a word about it. It should be science changing. I wonder, have you noticed a rash of uh, these live cosmology streams that are going on by the mainstream and they'll have like 1,200 people watching them? I wonder to myself sometimes, how can they have that much content? And then I remember, well, they show the same thing over and over again and they really don't have any content. So people walk away with the same thing they came in with. Nothing but entertainment, pretty pictures. Other than that, it does no good. I hear it's called ad nauseum. A persuasion tactic, or brainwashing. Hmm. Is the nearest alien planet, Proxima b, habitable? It's complicated. The surface of the potentially Earth-like exoplanet Proxima b, as imagined by an artist. Oh, we got a little video here. Well, let's give it a watch. It comes out. Just 4.22 light years away, barely wading distance into the cosmic ocean, the star closest to our sun, a dim red dwarf named Proxima Centauri turns out to have at least one possibly Earth-like planet. Astronomers are calling this world Proxima b. At one and a third times more massive than the Earth, it rides in the star's so-called habitable zone, where liquid water can exist, along with ice and water vapor. But don't get too excited about the possibilities for intelligent life. Researchers are not yet sure if this alien world is a dense rocky planet like Earth, or a much bigger ball of gas. The planet completes one of its orbits each 11.2 Earth days. Orbiting so close to its turbulent parent star, Proxima b is bombarded with X-rays 400 times stronger than what we receive from our Sun. The scientists also don't know if the planet has any moons. Our large, single moon seems to have played an important role in the evolution of life here. On the other hand, red dwarf stars can live hundreds of times longer than sun-like stars. So there may be plenty of time for biology to develop, adapt, and prosper. The detection was made by scientists of the Pale Red Dot Campaign using two especially sensitive instruments attached to the mountaintop telescopes of the European Southern Observatory at La Silla Chile in South America. A web of other observatories around the world has confirmed their findings. This discovery is the result of looking very closely at the wobbles of that star for 16 years. Data had hinted at such a planet for much of that time, but unambiguous proof came only in early 2016 along with teasing clues to a possible second planet at least five times further out in the system. Proxima b does not transit across the face of its parent star along the line of sight to Earth, which is how most of the exoplanets have been found so far. Sadly, that means researchers have one less method to see what sort of atmosphere Proxima b may have, but they may be able to sense the planet's glow with a future generation of detectors. How long is a day on Proxima b? Astronomers are not yet sure. Like many exoplanets lying close into their stars, Proxima b may be in tidal lock with its star, as the moon is with our Earth, so the planet's day and its year may be the same, in which case its surface temperature variations might look something like this. Or it may rotate three times for each two revolutions around its star, like planet Mercury does as it moves around our Sun. That would make for a much more even climate, which might be better for living organisms. Even though the red dwarf Proxima is much smaller than our Sun, it would look quite a bit larger in the skies of planet Proxima b because it's much closer to that world. Will eyes from Earth ever voyage there to see for themselves the red sunrise and any alien creatures that may be present? It's not out of the question. This red dwarf and its planets are part of the three-star family named Alpha Centauri. 
If engineers can get a lightweight probe up to a significant fraction of the speed of light, the journey to this fascinating system might only take a few decades. A few spacecraft have already proven they can survive for such periods. And now, this new era of interstellar exploration may have just identified its first target. For Space.com, I'm David Sky Brody. Speculation that a robotic probe may visit the world in the coming decade. But Earth size is a very different thing than Earth light, even though the newfound planet known as Proxima b appears to orbit in its star's habitable zone. The range of distances where water could exist in liquid form, nobody knows if it's actually capable of supporting life. I'm sure they know a lot more than they're letting. Rory Barnes, a professor of astronomy at the University of Washington, stressed this point in an essay posted on palered.org, the website dedicated to the Discovery Team's search for a planet around Proxima Centauri. Proxima b, the closest Earth-like planet discovery in picture. Scientists know only a few things about Proxima b for sure. Barnes wrote, its distance from Proxima Centauri, its orbital period, and its minimum mass. Well, the fact that it's outside of Worf means that it must have been expelled, right? There must have at least been one flare of Nova, whatever you want to call it. The information says Proxima b completes one lap around its star at 11.2 days. This orbit might be roughly circular, or it could be very elliptic. Nobody knows yet. Proxima Centauri b is at least as massive as Earth, but it could be heavier. Well, I'm surprised they don't already know what the core is made out of. Uh, usually they know these things. I've come to the conclusion that on Earth here, we're, we're, we just, life thrives in between cataclysm, catastrophe. If the planet is much larger, it may be more like Neptune with a thick gaseous envelope. Barnes wrote, an encouraging sign is that only a small number of possible orbits indicate the planet is a gas giant. So it's likely to be rocky like Earth. And there you have it, Proxima B. Comrade, here is something that might be of interest to you. NASA to explore Saturn's moon Titan for signs of life. Dragonfly drone in 2026. Apparently this drone's gonna fly around in Titan's atmosphere. NASA announces Dragonfly drone mission to Titan. A dual quadcopter drone will make dozens of flights across Saturn's largest moon, studying its chemistry and looking for signs of past and present life. Hopefully it won't get shot down. <laughs> Dragonfly, with its eight rotors, will explore Saturn's moons Titan by flight, first for an off-world mission. Today, NASA announced the next mission in their New Frontiers program to explore the solar system. Dragonfly, a drone lander, will explore Saturn's largest moon Titan. Dragonfly Wolf 10. Colorful names. NASA announced the next mission in their New Frontiers program to explore the solar system, Dragonfly. A drone leader will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Titan is the only solar system moon with an extensive atmosphere and standing bodies of liquid on its surface. The moon is also filled with organic materials and is thought to be similar to what early Earth might have looked like before life form, but with many of the same ingredients. Despite being a distant moon, it often ranks as one of the most Earth-like worlds in the solar system. Dragonfly, which will launch in 2026 and land on Titan in 2034, let's see, I'll be, eesh, I don't think about it, is being managed by Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. It will be able to make multiple autonomous flights, up to a few dozen, powered by its rotors across Titan's surface. Then it'll just be trashed. In total, it will spend about two and a half years exploring Titan's geology and chemistry. This includes flying over 100 miles and searching for the possibility of life in the past or even in the present day. They can make this little flight copter last for two and a half years on Titan, but they can't make a car battery that goes over 45 miles an hour and lasts longer than 12 hours. I don't know. Go figure. The spacecraft, Dragonfly, 
weighs nearly a thousand pounds and is roughly the size of a dune buggy. A thousand pound vehicle flying around in its atmosphere. <laughs> well, I think that the atmosphere is a lot thicker there. Let's read. Thanks to the, the thick cover of Titan's atmosphere, well, there you go, and its distance from the sun, Dragonfly can't rely on solar power and will instead carry a multiple mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. That sounds like something from Felix the Cat's magic bag of tricks. Like the one the Curiosity rover uses on Mars. Dragonfly will carry multiple cameras to take pictures on its journey, both from a distance and up close when it lands, to get a zoomed-in image of material it studies. It also carries a mass spectrometer, allowing it to analyze in detail the materials it encounters across Titan's surface and determine their chemical makeup. It can perform meteorological studies as it cruises Titan's atmosphere in seismic studies to examine Titan's underground. The drone will first land in Titan's sand dunes near the equatorial region. It has no wheels, but it can make short hops of only a few feet if it spies something interesting nearby. But it's also designed to fly up to eight or nine miles at a time. A thousand pounds. Pretty impressive. Traveling long distances to explore many different areas of Titan. Its eventual goal is Selk Crater. Researchers are especially interested in its in this impact crater because of the combination of past liquid water, organic materials, and energy. These are seen as the three crucial ingredients for life. Kurt Niebuhr. Kurt Niebuhr. Kurt Niebuhr, the leading program scientist for NASA's New Frontiers program, explained during the press conference event that this makes Cell Crater an excellent proxy for ancient Earth and what it might have looked like before life arose. We can't go back in time, Niebuhr said, but we can go to Titan. The destination. When the Huygens probe landed on Titan in 2005, researchers had no idea what to expect. Huygens revealed a complex world covered in lakes of methane and ethane filled with sandy dunes of organic materials and with a complete methane cycle, analogous to Earth's water cycle. Meanwhile, the Cassini spacecraft kept watch from its orbit around Saturn for more than a decade, eventually learning to map Titan's surface in great detail. It was able to reveal Titan's lakes and seas growing and shrinking with the seasons. These rich details had scientists hungering for a dedicated Titan mission, which Dragonfly will now fulfill. Uh, let's see, Dragonfly's full mission will last almost two years because of Titan's slow movements. A full day on Titan lasts roughly 16 Earth days. Wow. Now that's the way it should be. One day lasts 16. That's more like it. Dragonfly will spend its eight-day days flying, communicating, and performing science tasks, and its eight-day nights recharging its batteries, with no station there. Impressive. It will perform most of its science from the ground, where it can directly access samples of Titan's surface and run them through its on-site laboratory. Dragonfly is part of NASA's New Frontiers program, which is responsible for the New Horizons mission to Pluto. The Juno mission currently studying Jupiter and OSIRIS-REx, what an interesting name, which is orbiting the asteroid Bennu and planning to return samples back to Earth. Researchers will have to wait more than a decade to see any results from Dragonfly, but Titan's complex world is surely worth the wait. Alright, that's interesting. And they will also be searching for life, but we won't know about that. Titan's scoopy skies drizzling complex hydrocarbons onto the moon's surface, potentially providing the building blocks of life. Hmm. Wouldn't that be nice to have everything we need to survive or to sustain us drizzle from the sky? The moon Titan was discovered in 1655 by Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens. Titan was the first known moon of Saturn and the sixth known moon at that time in the solar system, after Earth's moon and the Galilean moons, the big four.
It is also known as a frozen flammable world with hundreds of times more hydrocarbons than all the reserves on planet Earth combined. Light takes an hour to get there. Nevertheless, NASA astronomers speculate that cellular life could exist there. But enter the thunderbolts and they say not so fast. No, not so fast, Mr. Smarty Pants. The Great Titan Desert. July 1st, 2019, Clay Kern. Titan is not wet. On October 15th, 1997, NASA launched the six-ton Cassini-Huygens spacecraft the largest space mission ever deployed at the time. Its name was changed twice during the mission. The Cassini Equinox mission was a two-year extension that began on July 1, 2008, following the completion of its prime mission from July 1, 2004 to June 30, 2008. It was then changed to the Cassini Solstice mission, named for the summer solstice on Saturn that took place May of 2017. Cassini burned up in Saturn's atmosphere on Friday, September 16, 2017. Cassini's mission uncovered many problems. Methane gas escapes from Titan's atmosphere, where sunlight changes it back into carbon and hydrogen. Titan is supposed to be billions of years old. So how has its methane atmosphere survived? It should have evaporated eons ago. Astrophysicists resolve that issue by imagining large lakes of liquid methane on the surface. That idea suffered a blow when Huygens' lander touched down on a rocky plain. No methane rain was detected and no methane puddles were seen. Instead, a vast dry expanse covered with sand dunes and dry river channels was seen. Huygens used a probe attached to its bottom with a pressure sensor programmed with a variety of materials. The mission team reported that the lander felt something moist, but the data also indicated dry sand. Methane drifted around the probe, but quickly dissipated, presumably because of the lander's heat. According to a recent press release, planetary scientists analyzing Cassini's data archive found more anomalies. Titan, they speculate, has a weather cycle like Earth, except it involves methane instead of water. Evaporation clouds, rain, rivers, lakes, and seas are said to exist on Titan, despite its temperature of minus 220 Celsius. How those catchments were formed is a puzzle, since they do not fit well with computer models. Images transmitted from Titan's surface revealed a rocky landscape with the consistency of sand, a field of small pebbles extended from the horizon. Spectrographic analysis established that the rocks are made of water ice. It is easy to understand how ice can appear to be like rock when it is at a temperature of minus 220 Celsius. Huygens did not find any liquids of any kind. The press announcement stated that they saw small lakes from orbit that evaporated over time. However, what they did not see was those lakes refilling during Cassini's mission. The Cassini Equinox orbiter detected an infrared reflection from an area known as Kraken Mare, Monster Ocean, that covers more than 400,000 square kilometers in Titan's north polar region. Is Kraken Mare really a lake larger than Earth's Lake Superior? As noted in a previous picture of the day, the lakes on Titan are similar to the, the Maria, to the Maria or Maria of our own moon. Every brachiated channel on Titan is dry. They all have dark flat floors with no evidence of flowing liquids. Coupled with the observation that Titan's Kraken Mare resembles Mare Serenitatis more than it does Lake Superior. The same rails are present on Titan as on the Moon. Electric Universe advocate Wall Thornhill observed that images from Cassini are typical of, of arc machining of the surface. I would compare them directly to the scallop scarring on Jupiter's moon Io and the flat melted floor depressions that result. Such floors 
would be expected to give a dark radar return. The fact that lakes are also close by the vast dune fields in the polar regions suggests an electrical origin sometime in the past. It is in the southern and northern latitudes of Titan that they are found. Since electrical activity carved the surface of other rocky bodies, why would it come as a surprise to find that it has also been at work on Titan? It is a distinct probability that the infrared light seen by Cassini was a reflection from hardened glass-like surfaces. Once again, Stephen Smith, the busy beaver. <laughs> when the sperm of the male is received by that little egg. As I will show you, English is the, the, one, the best language in the world for understanding this science because the English language comes from the... Uh, and, oops, what am I doing? I better concentrate. Anglican. Anglican. British is also not an English word, it's a Jewish word, Hebrew word. Covenant of the people. So Anglican, British, everybody appropriated all of this science and Egypt was the mother of it. Not the inventor, they were the mother of it that passed it on to the Greeks and the Romans. And the English now have the language that resembles it the most. And down the middle, Good number. Four comes along. Whoops. Two and two. So, as Pythagoras said, the world is made by numbers. All is number. All is number. God makes things by numbers. All the philosophers, all the schools have ever said that. Numbers. And these are the numbers. Unity, division. Unity, division. The two forces. Good and evil. Adam and Eve. Adam and evil. Uniting and dividing, uniting and dividing. Electricity and magnetism, that's all it does. Walter Russell says clearly, it says there's only one thing that happens in the universe, that's electricity. And we happen to call it positive electricity and negative electricity, which is electromagnetism. And everything is doing that. That's, and that is the spectrum. That is where we live. Notice this arch here, Aries, Taurus, all the way, and you've got Libra here. You have seven. Remember, we said that... Spot on. Sinister is, is the left brain. That's sinister. This is Dexter, right. Now, the thing is, when you use your right hand, you're actually engaging your sinister brain. And this is why the hierarchy, these guys here, when, when, when you go to school, they want you to use your right hand and they smack you if, you use, you, if you're using your left hand. Because when you're using your left hand, you're engaging the feminine right brain. And they don't like that. Because <laughs> you, you, you connect a lot of things together, join a lot of dots with this one. This one over here doesn't see the dots. So it's good you can manipulate people over here. So this is why sin comes from sinister. Because people are living in that left brain which is associated with the cerebellum, bellum being at war with God the good, and people are easily to be controlled, you see. But also remember, it's ruled by Uranus. And Uranus is the daddy of Saturn. Beyond the spheres of Saturn is Uranus. Uranus means heaven. Heaven is heaved up.
This is heaved up. This is the heaven. You see, when Jesus dies at the age of this is why he up heaven, Uranus, the father of Saturn, who is ruling the age of Aquarius. Uranus and Saturn together. And we are here. And we have been in this ruled by Jupiter, which is capitalistic wealth and greed and money. Because Jupiter has a consort, Juno. And Juno is where money, Juno Moneta, was pressed in Rome. In 1974, Carl Sagan sent a message into space two ways, one by a plaque on the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft, another one was sent by the Arecibo telescope in 1974 as well. It's the 1974 broadcast known as the Arecibo message was put together by Carl Sagan and colleagues was sent into space via radio waves at a special ceremony to celebrate the remodeling of the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico was the most powerful broadcast ever deliberately beamed out into space, directed at a star cluster sitting approximately 25,000 light years away. It consisted of a message depicting our planet's location in the solar system, the core principles of our math and science, and the NASA antenna used to transmit the signal in hopes that it would be interrupted by an extraterrestrial intelligence so they could come here and eat us. <laughs> the message also included details about human beings such as our physical appearance and DNA code. The signal was a million times stronger than a typical TV transmission. You can see the message here. 27 years later in 2001, the crop circle phenomenon gained a well-deserved attention when a pattern in the form of a response to the 74 broadcast appeared right next to Britain's largest telescope, the Chill Bolton and Observatory, home to the world's largest fully steerable meteorological radar. It's one of the most amazing crop circles ever to appear, regardless of whether you believe it was done by human beings or extraterrestrial intelligence. What these researchers claim is that the humans kill the crops. The legitimate crop circles are not killed. Here is a picture of what seems to be the response to the message sent in 1974 by NASA. The message describes a different solar system, an image of the sender, just like the original NASA message, non-human DNA, a microwave antenna instead of the radio wave antenna that was depicted in ours, microwaves. Hmm. It was written off as a hoax, like most crop circles are within the mainstream face also appeared in a rectangular image. The face represented a new technique in crop circle generation, a screen technique that is also used for printing face on a piece of paper. What's also interesting to note is the fact that the microwave antenna signal in this crop circle also appeared a year earlier in the same exact field. And uh, the, the most compelling thing about it to me, and he's not really saying it in this article, but the planets that the alien creatures say that they inhabit is the, we say that, right, we inhabit the third rock from the star. In the aliens one, they inhabit the third, fourth, and fifth rocks from the star. And that is a cool match to the habitable zone of the Trappist-1 system. Could it be that this crop circle is an answer from Trappist-1? Well, we'll never know, because 9-11 came and the whole thing was swept under the rug, of course. But it is very interesting to say the least. What do you think? Do extraterrestrials really have some fancy way to leave crop circles? 
It sure would seem that way. Trappist One is a red dwarf star. It seems to be solo. I haven't heard him mention any mates. Discovered in 1999, it is roughly 10% the mass of the Sun. Three of its planets are located within the habitable zone of the star, that is the region where liquid water can occur. And Trappist-1 has the honor of having the most planets in a habitable zone discovered so far, with our solar system only having two. And that all depends on whose chart you're looking at. Some charts have Venus in the habitable zone and Mars out, and other charts are vice versa. I suspect much the same in the case of Trappist-1 as well. The AT race also claimed that they had 21 billion souls. It's a lot more than we have, but you realize in 1970, we had 3 billion people on Earth rough. It's more than doubled since then. Life is very possible on these worlds. However, it may look different, says. My guess is it would have four limbs and a head. That seems to be a universal standard for meat robots. But as you know, that depends on all kinds of factors. Trappist-1 is 39 light years from Earth, or 235 trillion miles. It's not too far. But personally, I like to keep an open mind on these things, because you never know. Nothing is a sure thing. And the fact that we exist, to me, is proof enough that life does indeed exist in the universe. My God, there's going to be a crop circle there tomorrow morning. Oh, wow. Oh, there's another one. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Come here. My hands felt just like two balloons.
I realized quite a while ago now that the only one I can control in the world is myself. So if I make myself a person who is productive to the earth in my lifetime, I will have done a huge part even though it's the smallest part. If everybody did that, then we can rest easy to know that our good earth is going to be around for a long time to come. We stand a much better chance of making it. Take care. Please consider joining my Patreon club. The few members that are there are lonely. <laughs> I'll see you on down the road. Don't forget, tomorrow, 1 o'clock, now I have to go cram for the exams.